episode 131, Devil and Angel, First Hospital. Zoe stared at the contact on her phone, and after a few seconds of debating, she pressed the button to make a call. She waited as it rang. After a few seconds, it went to voicemail. She sighed, tried calling again, but to no avail. Her only way out of this hospital isn't picking up the call. Her shoulders drooped in disappointment. She knew it was practically impossible to leave this hospital. Her grandfather would go berserk if she left so quickly. She thought about convincing him to let her recuperate somewhere else besides the hospital. She was about to close her contacts, but she paused when her eyes fell on a familiar phone number. Subconsciously, her fingers hovered over the name, her eyes softening. Ryan. Biting her bottom lip, she felt guilty. Playing back their last conversation in her mind, she realized she was slightly wrong. She thought her stubbornness was normal. What right did he have to intrude into her life and force her to do something? The tiny devil on her shoulder whispered to her, He's a control freak. Don't go back to him. But the angel told her, He did it because he cares for your health and safety. Zoe thought back to his scorned expression. She had crossed a line. The angel continued to coerce her. He wouldn't have stepped in if he didn't care for you. Why do you think he was so angry? You've constantly fought against his words and even dared to insult him. But he allowed you to do so and rarely got angry. Why would he become so infuriated out of nowhere? It's because you misunderstood his intentions. After what felt like a really long time, she grew tired of listening to her thoughts. She flicked both off of her. The conversation was beginning to bother her because deep down, she knew the angel was right. He was too controlling of her. But his intentions this time were right. She wanted to have a proper conversation with him to explain the parts she disliked about him. And he could do the same in return. Her phone dinged and she hastily looked down, thinking it might be a message from Ryan. But it was just a random email. Her shoulders unconsciously sagged in disappointment. Staring at the contact list, her eyes couldn't leave Ryan's name. Without even thinking her actions through, she pressed the call button. It rang once and went straight through to voicemail. Stunned at the response, she called again. The same thing happened. He was ignoring her. With a frown, she decided to turn her phone off and go to sleep. But that was another mistake. The second she fell asleep, she was plunged into a nightmare. In her dreams, she was walking barefooted in an abyss of nothingness. Then, suddenly, there was a light at the end of what seemed to be a long tunnel. Wanting a way out of this world of darkness, her slow steps quickly turned into a sprint towards the light. When she got closer, her heart dropped. In her dream was a man with the same build as Ryan, but she couldn't see his face. His back was turned to her, but she could tell by the way the man had one hand inside of his pocket that this was, of course, Ryan. The man was walking away from her, and leaving with him was the light. Unconsciously, she followed him, not wanting the light to disappear from her vision. And right when she was close to him, something emerged from the corner of her eyes. Zoe turned her head and was taken aback to see the beautiful outline of a woman. Her outfit, the sway of her steps, and the breathtaking face. She felt her lips curl into a scowl. What was that secretary of Ryan doing in her dreams? She tried to grab Ryan, but a force held her back. It felt as if something was grabbing her ankle, holding her in place. She tried to speak, but nothing came out. Envy burned within her when she saw the man walk to the woman, grab her by the waist, and then bury his head into her neck, the same way he always did with her. She refused to see it. She refused to see them lock lips together. But even when she tried to close her eyes, she couldn't do so. A force was holding her head in place, refusing to let her look away. In the background, there was someone speaking. Zoe! She stiffened when something touched her, but she didn't know what it was. Zoe! A voice called out. Frankie scowled in annoyance when she saw Zoe was in a deep sleep. Hey, sleeping beauty, wake up! She screamed, continuing to shake her stubborn friend awake. Calling her name was of no use, so she had to resort to harsher means of waking her up. Stop sleeping already! It's already two in the afternoon!
Frankie whined, continuing to shake her awake with so much force, the Birkin shoulder bag was beginning to slip off of her. Growing irritated at Zoe's lack of response, she pressed her lips together, threw off her shoulder bag, and then, using all of her strength, tugged the blankets off of Zoe. <sighs> Zoe groaned, her eyes slowly peeling open. She squinted, her vision blurry with exhaustion. Tiredly, she rubbed her eyes. Frankie? She mumbled in confusion. Ugh, finally! Frankie let out a heavy sigh, placing the blanket back onto the poor woman's shivering body. She felt guilty for pulling the blanket off of a sick person, especially one that was prone to easily getting cold. What are you doing here? Zoe sat up in her bed. To talk some sense into you! Frankie pressed her lips together as she placed the pillow behind Zoe. Originally, she was planning to rest after the exhausting photo shoot that ran from late in the afternoon yesterday until noon today. Her manager had worked her to the ground. But her desire to sleep for the rest of the day was put to a halt after she heard about the dispute between the budding couple, whose relationship was too unstable to have a fight. If it wasn't for her good friend, who was one of the men guarding outside the hospital room, she wouldn't have known an argument occurred. Frankie always sided with Zoe, but this time she couldn't take her side, especially after she heard the crazy woman was bold enough to escape the room and place her health on the line. Frankie pulled up a chair to the bed and sat down, crossing her arms like a disappointed mother. Her lips tugged down in a disapproving frown as she gave Zoe a mean look. Zoe took in the appearance of her best friend and sighed. Did Ryan send you? Frankie was slightly shocked to hear the bitterness in Zoe's voice. Was the fight really that bad? Her bodyguard friend told her that Ryan left in a fit of rage, slamming the door so loudly it could be heard down the hallway. No, he didn't. I came here myself after secretly hearing what happened yesterday night. Zoe analyzed Frankie's posture. Her lips didn't twitch, and neither was she nervously playing with her clothes. She wasn't lying. Ryan really didn't send her. Before I judge, I want to hear your perspective first. Frankie didn't want to rashly make a conclusion and place the blame on anyone first. She trusted Zoe to tell the truth. Zoe hung her head and nervously played with her fingers. She didn't want to tell Frankie anything. It was hard to do so because a big part of her knew she was definitely in the wrong. The nightmare she had earlier served as a warning to her that Ryan could only deal with her conflicting ways for so long. One day, he might really leave her if he gets pushed into a corner. Frankie felt her eyes become gentle upon seeing the state of her friend. I can wait. You don't have to speak up now. Her voice was faint and calm. Her initial annoyance dispersed. After a few seconds of comfortable silence, Zoe slowly nodded her head. Did you apologize to my brother yet? She checked the time and saw it was now three in the afternoon. She figured it was a dumb question, seeing as Zoe had just woken up. No. I texted Joshua before I got here. Ryan doesn't have a meeting until four o'clock. He's most likely in his office doing some paperwork. I'm sure if you call him now, he will have time to speak with you. Frankie wanted them to fix the issue as soon as possible. I tried calling him earlier. Frankie was surprised to hear this. If she called him earlier, why didn't Ryan visit the hospital room? Her bodyguard friend didn't mention anything about seeing Ryan. Episode 132, Happiest Around Each Other. But he didn't pick up. I called him twice. It went straight to voicemail after the first ring. What time did you call him? Zoe checked the phone. Around one in the morning? Frankie became worried. One in the morning was the exact time her brother arrived home yesterday. She knew because the butler looking over Ryan's mansion always reported to her mother the time he would come home. This realization upsetted her. Ryan was stubbornly ignoring Zoe. It was surprising for her to hear about this. Her brother was always patient around Zoe and tolerated almost all of her disrespect. Was the situation this serious now? Was he truly offended by her words? I'll call him. No, Zoe yelled. 
When she saw the confused expression on Frankie's face, she added on, I created this mess, so I should be the one to fix it. All right then, Frankie firmly nodded, agreeing with her approach. Before you do anything, tell me where you think you screwed up. She wanted to make sure Zoe had everything sorted out before talking to Ryan. Zoe awkwardly scratched the back of her head. My stubbornness? Frankie slowly shook her head. Your stubbornness was not the issue here. From my perspective, he doesn't seem to mind your spoiled temperament. She leaned into the chair, resting her face on her propped up arm. Well, he shouldn't mind it in the first place, since he's the one who encourages your behavior. She dryly said, remembering the moments she witnessed her brother doting on Zoe. Think harder to the moment the fight started. Zoe thought about the argument, deeply thinking about her refusal to stay in the bed. He was worried over her health, but she stubbornly pushed him away. He's mad because I insulted him when all he wanted to do was care for me. Zoe sighed. They had both screwed up here. His intentions came from a good place, but his approach did not. Frankie slowly nodded, her face stern like a headmistress acknowledging a troubled student. You're absolutely right. He's also in the wrong. But you have to understand, my brother tries his hardest to chase after you. It's okay to play hard to get or struggle to open up to him. My brother is used to having things always go his way. It's in his nature. Her older brother was spoiled by both sides of the family for being the eldest and a son. He doesn't know how to properly take care of others, which is why his approach is so overbearing. He was trying to keep you safe in the best way he knew, by locking you in a room. The same thing has happened to me in the past when a rough scandal broke out. I don't want to justify his behavior, but I just want you to understand why he does it, Frankie frowned. However, both of you guys have abnormally high egos that constantly clash with each other. Frankie wanted to side with Zoe, but she also had an obligation to Ryan. In the end, she wanted both of them to be happy, and from her perspective, they were the happiest around each other. Your stubbornness will clash with his, and that's completely understandable. But I recommend talking about it with my brother. Try to come up with a solution where instead of you guys rashly lashing out at each other, you guys can try sitting down and having a civilized conversation. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Frankie paused to give Zoe some thinking time. My brother likes you very much, and he does not want to lose you. But you're constantly pushing him away. Because of that, he's more inclined to think that all of his approaches aren't working. She continued to ramble. Zoe, how do you feel about my brother? Your desire to work on the relationship depends on it. Think about it carefully. Zoe was lost in a daydream while she pondered over Frankie's words. After a moment of silence, her face clicked with recognition. Ryan had done his part in chasing her. It was now her turn to do the same. At this point of their entwining path, it wasn't a matter of pride or ego. What was most important was understanding how she felt for him, and she already knew the answer to that question. Every part of her wanted him. It was finally time for her to run after a man who would finally treat her well. Yeah, I understand, Zoe nodded, ready to climb out of the bed and go to his office. Whoa there, where do you think you're going? Frankie quickly blocked Zoe's attempt to leave the bed. She hurriedly grabbed the blankets and tucked her inside. To see Ryan? Zoe responded. If he wasn't going to pick up the phone, the only way to talk to him would be to go and see him personally. Nah, you're not going to personally see him. I'll bring him here. Frankie said, shaking her head at the way Zoe's brain worked. How could she not prioritize her health? No, I should be the one doing the chasing this time. On his way here, he'll think too much and begin to expect things from me. Hey, put away the phone. Zoe grabbed Frankie, who had taken out her phone to call Joshua. Stop it, Frankie. In her attempt to grab the phone, Zoe had accidentally forced Frankie's finger to press on the call key. It rang once, twice, and on the third time, a deep voice picked up. Good afternoon, Miss West. How may I help you today? Joshua politely spoke up, a slight noise in the background. 
Frankie triumphantly smirked. What is my brother doing right now? She stuck her tongue out at Zoe, who looked infuriated on the bed, but didn't dare to speak up now that the call was placed on speaker. Boss is currently on his way to a meeting. Can the meeting be postponed? Frankie cut straight to the chase. Her shameless question took Joshua by surprise. I'm afraid that's not possible. He has tons of meetings. I'm sure he can place this one on hold. Joshua slightly frowned, but kept his voice respectful and firm. He knew the West women were very persistent when it came to placing family over work. This request was not uncommon, for it had happened many times before in the past. He has already boarded the airplane to the meeting. It's on the other side of the country, and the flight will take at least four hours. Joshua declared, his response stunning the women in the room. Episode 133, Unreasonable. Didn't you say he was in his office? Yes, but he was previously preparing himself for the meeting. Ugh, when will he come back then? What is he doing right now? Is he busy? Joshua turned his head to the other leather couch chair at the other side of the luxurious private jet. He looked at his boss, who was furiously typing on his laptop. With his glasses hanging on the bridge of his nose, his boss was very concentrated on the task at hand. It would not be wise to interrupt his workaholic mood. Yes, he's busy. Can't he spare just a few minutes on the phone then? I'd like to talk to him about the urgent issues. I'm afraid he's not in the best condition to speak. Joshua continued to remain staunch. He hoped Frankie would be sympathetic and understand his boss's values were completely different from hers. He was her brother, and she should know by now that once the boss had entered his workaholic mode, there was no turning back. To interrupt him was to ask for a death wish. But it's really, really important, and it concerns his future. Zoe understood the situation at hand. If he can't talk, don't pester him about it. I can wait, she quietly whispered, so that only Frankie could hear her. Seeing as he had his obligations to work, Zoe did not want to sound clingy. In the past, Mike had scorned her many times for being so clingy. She didn't want the same thing to happen with Ryan. She didn't want to be a burden again. Joshua pinched the spot between his brows, his patience running low. I'm afraid not, Miss West. Everyone on the private jet was busy preparing for an excruciatingly important meeting that would cost the company at least one billion. With that price tag alone, everyone was on high alert. Joshua unconsciously looked in Chloe's direction. She had already finished creating the presentation and was on her way to memorizing it. All these years of strict training from their boss truly paid off. In just minutes, she had finished the presentation, written a plan, and even had the script prepared. She was quiet and rarely unreasonable. Why can't all women be like her? Or more in particular, why can't Frankie behave like that? But it concerns Zoe. I'm sure Ryan will spare a few minutes to speak to her. Frankie refused to back down. She didn't care if she sounded irritably annoying. She was a rich heiress. This behavior was expected of her. Growing up, everyone waited upon her requests. She was dearly loved by both sides of her family, doted on by her parents, and pampered like a porcelain doll by her older brothers. All these years have cultivated a fine but demanding young woman whose motto was always, it's either my way or no way at all. Joshua frowned. Miss West persisted because of Zoe? His opinion of the young woman soured. At first, he had mild respect for her because of her competence and seemingly valuable abilities. But who would have known, behind that facade was another clingy woman. He let out an exasperated sigh. Why were the women in his boss's life so obnoxious? At least ask for his opinion on the matter before downright rejecting me. I just want to hear what Ryan has to say. Frankie knew Joshua's role as the secretary was to answer for his boss, but she was his younger sister. She wanted to personally call Ryan earlier, but knowing her brother's temperament and extreme dedication to his work, he would not even glance at his phone if he was busy doing something. Joshua's disapproving frown deepened when he saw how long they'd talked for. It was time to go back to his pile of work before Ryan reprimanded him for not utilizing his time properly. Every second on this airplane counted. 
I shall pass the phone to him now. He finally relented, gesturing for a flight attendant to step forward. She passed the phone to Ryan, who didn't even look up when the beautiful and charming woman walked to him. President West, pardon my intrusion, but Mr. Bing... I'm busy, Ryan muttered, never once lifting his eyes from his laptop. He was glued to it, reading the reports and typing on it like a madman. The flight attendant turned to Joshua, who made a gesture, be more persistent. She hesitated, and right when she opened her mouth to speak again, a loud voice spoke through the phone. Ryan! Frankie screamed into the phone in hopes of catching his attention. The flight attendant was surprised to hear such a loud voice, nearly dropping the phone in the process. She took a secretive glance at it and was shocked to see it was not on speaker mode. Ryan's lips dipped low into a scowl. He reluctantly placed his glasses down and took the phone without sparing the flight attendant a single glance. What is it? Don't you know I'm busy right now? Ryan continued to analyze the documents on his laptop. When are you coming back from the trip? There's someone that wants to see you. I don't have the time or interest to entertain your model friends. His lips thinned. The air around him became suffocating. She pastored his secretary and forced him to pick up the phone just for this stupid reason. He was one second away from calling his parents to pick up this annoying sister of his. No, it's not my friend. Wait, it is, but she's more of a sister than a friend. You know, like sisters from another mother. Get to the point. Ryan sent out a message to his guards in Boston to go and fetch her. It was time she faced their parents' wrath. Um, can you wrap up the meeting really quickly? I was thinking you should come and visit Zoe. She has something to say. He hung up the phone. Frankie parted her lips in shock, glancing at the blank screen, her mouth opening and closing. She couldn't believe he hung up the phone on her. Fuming, she called again, but it went straight to voicemail without any ring. He had blocked her. She was too scared to turn around and see Zoe's reaction. The situation was a lot worse than expected. Oh, Lord, what am I supposed to do now? Ryan tossed the phone onto the floor after blocking Frankie's number. He threw it so hard, the screen immediately cracked on impact. Joshua winced upon seeing his damaged phone. Because of his boss's unhappiness, the entire atmosphere in the airplane became unbearable. It was hard to breathe, especially with the murderous chill hanging in the air. Episode 134, Thunder. Frankie refused to give up. She called her brother again, but he didn't pick up. She frowned and attempted to do it again, but before she could, her mother called her. Her face became visibly pale upon seeing the picture of her mother flash on her phone. She swallowed the lump in her throat and nervously looked at Zoe. My mom is calling, she whispered as if she was scared of getting caught for doing something bad. Pick it up then, Zoe said, knowing the more Frankie made her mother wait, the more Madame West would be infuriated. Frankie looked at her nervously. Can you pick it up for me? The phone stopped ringing. She let out a sigh of relief, only to panic again when her father's contact flashed. Oh my God, it's my dad! She yelped, nearly tossing the phone to the other side of the room. Just pick it up, Frankie. They'll continue to call you if you don't, Zoe said. Missed calls from both of her parents would not look good for her if she's taken back to the West Mansion. She could stop Ryan, but she knew she couldn't stop her parents if they sent people to pick up their daughter. Uh, all right, Frankie whispered. She walked to the corner of the room and talked in hushed voices with her parents. Zoe patiently waited for the phone call to end. She laid down on the bed, stared at the ceiling, and sighed. I really hate this place. The hospital ceiling was boring. The scent from the humidifier was beginning to annoy her. The smell of chemicals and disinfectants was beginning to bring back haunting memories, and she despised every second spent in here. She reached for her phone and debated the idea of calling her grandfather. She wanted to coerce him into allowing her to leave the hospital and recuperate somewhere else. Anywhere was fine, as long as it wasn't in a hospital. Just then, she remembered Lily, who was probably waiting for her. Sitting up in her bed, she was about to climb out and get ready for the day, when Frankie walked back to her with a distraught expression. What's wrong? Zoe immediately asked. 
My parents want me to return home. The chauffeur is already waiting for me downstairs, Frankie grimly said. She didn't want to go back home because she knew they would bombard her with questions the second she stepped in the house. She kicked the chair beside her, a pout on her face. Stupid Brian, he's always doing this. Not only was he controlling of Zoe, but he's also controlling me. What type of brother is he? Just because he's the eldest, it doesn't mean he has the right to interfere with my life. Frankie added on, frustrated that her own brother would rat her out. Zoe sighed. Guess we're in the same boat. She rolled her eyes, not understanding why he always has to be in control all the time. Why couldn't he relax and just let fate play its course? Sometimes I really want to hit him. The phone rang again. Zoe pressed her lips together and groaned when she saw it was her father calling her. Zoe also saw the contact name. Go home. I'll be fine, she said, shooing the young woman out of the door. A few minutes after she left, the nurse came in to change her bandages and IV bag. Soon after, a female doctor walked in to check on her condition. After a series of questions, Zoe surprisingly got permission to walk around a bit to get her joints moving again. Once the doctor left, she carefully took a shower, changed into a fresh set of hospital wear, and then opened the door of her room. Once again, a group of men was blocking it. She already knew who they were. The doctor said I can walk around a bit. She spoke up, but they didn't budge. I'm going to another patient's room for a small chat, she added on. After a few seconds of awkward silence where she thought her request was rejected, they finally stepped aside. The boss has instructed us to accompany you wherever you go. You must come back as soon as the doctor or nurse arrive with the daily medicine. One of them gruffly said, to which Zoe reluctantly nodded. It was better than nothing. She wordlessly walked down the hall to Lily's room, and to her absolute surprise, the girl was gone. The room was freshly cleaned, and all of the gifts were gone. Lily had gone home. This was strange to Zoe, because she thought the child would be eager to stay because of their promise. With a reluctant sigh, she closed the door and walked down the halls. When she heard a sharp cry behind her, she jumped in fright. Her heart pounded a million beats per second at the sudden outbreak of noise in the quiet hallways. Zoe turned back and saw it was just a mother with her newly born child. They were an adoring pair. She looked young with a motherly expression on her face. She softly comforted her crying baby, whispering gentle words and lightly swaying her body. Behind the woman was a big window that looked outside. The skies were dark and gray. It was going to rain soon, and judging from the rumbling skies, it might even thunder. She hurriedly went back to her room right as the first sound of thunder rumbled the skies. Boom! She cried out in fear, flicking off the lights and hurriedly running back into her room. She didn't know where her fear of thunder came from, but she developed it sometime in her childhood. Shaking in her blanket, her body went stiff. Her fingers dug into her skin, pain spreading from the area. Memories of the past came flooding back, forcing her to bury herself deeper into her bed, as if it could provide some comfort and shelter from the terrifying sounds outside. Richard had just finished a meeting when the first clap of thunder. He looked at the enormous window overlooking Boston, and his face turned dark. Prepare the car right away, he instructed Leonard, who quickly called the driver over. Not wasting a single second, he hurriedly rushed into the hospital and straight to his granddaughter's room. The bodyguard stepped aside upon seeing Richard. When he pushed the door open, his heart dropped a bit. The lights were turned off, but he could clearly see the pitiful silhouette of a trembling body hiding beneath a white blanket. He turned on the light and walked to her. Zoe? He called out, but she didn't respond. Leonard didn't dare enter the room. He closed the door and waited patiently outside. Checking the weather reports, he sighed. It was going to rain and thunder all night long. Zoe, it's merely thunder, Richard said, but she remained quiet. He frowned at this, but reminded himself to be patient. Ever since her childhood days, she was always scared of thunder. He was used to this scene of her buried under her blankets, shaking and whimpering in fear. 
He didn't understand what was so scary about thunder. It was just the sound. So we come out from under the blanket. Richard was not good at handling these types of situations. It was often left up to the nannies or caretakers of the house who always came in to comfort her while he would anxiously watch from the sidelines in fear that something would go wrong. Episode 135, You Don't Know Her. Leonard was patiently waiting outside of the room when he received a notification. He glanced down at his phone and felt his mood dampen. In his boss's rush to leave the office, the two forgot there was an important meeting with the CEO from Canada coming up soon. They wanted to build a hotel in Toronto, a city facing a sharp increase in tourism. This meeting was crucial, for this was the day the final proposal contracts were to be signed and the transfer of funds was to commence. He paced for a few seconds, debating what he should do. In his line of work as a secretary, he was supposed to separate his emotions from his duties. But at this moment, he was more worried about the young woman who was once notorious for her unstable behavior and temper. She was very unpredictable. Thus, he was worried what might happen to her if she were left alone. However, he also had to take into account the importance of this meeting. Leonard sighed. It was time to place business over emotions. He knocked on the door and opened it slowly. Richard turned his head to Leonard with a disapproving scowl. What is it? He impatiently asked, displeased at the interruption. Sir, the meeting regarding the hotel in Toronto is about to start soon. We have to head back now. Leonard worriedly looked at Zoe. Even from the door, he could see her body completely wrapped in a blanket up to her head. Every few seconds, he could hear a sniffle. Was she crying? Was Thunder this scary? He looked out the window and was unfazed by the heavy rain. Neither of the men jumped, but Zoe did. She let out a terrified shriek, the sound desperate and defeated. Richard was faced with a dilemma. He couldn't leave her here unattended like this, nor could he miss the meeting. An idea came into his mind. It was rash, but it was the only thing he could do in this case. If he couldn't remain here and comfort her, there were people in the main mansion who could, starting from old butler Reginald. Have her escorted to the main mansion. He looked around the hospital room, his nose wrinkling. The smell of the eucalyptus essential oils was too strong, and when slightly mixed with the slightest smell of chemicals, made him nauseated. This room, despite its size, was stuffy and uncomfortable. But what about her wounds? When the storm dies down, call for Dr. Green. Dr. Green had taken care of Zoe ever since she was a child. He was the one who treated her for the smallest paper cuts to high fevers and was also one of the few selected people she allowed to get close to her when she was younger. On their way back to the office, Leonard glanced at his boss from the rear view mirror. Richard was lost in thought as he stared out the window, his eyes unclear and filled with worry. He didn't want to leave the hospital this soon, especially since she had just awoken, but the environment was not good for her. If there was one thing that her therapist had told him, it was the fact that she was easily triggered. Her mental state had immensely improved over the past two years, but it was still very easy for her to go back to her old self if she was faced with the slightest trauma. The thunder, combined with her fear of hospitals, was a dangerous risk he was not willing to take. Sir, I hate to pry, but will Miss Zoe be sent back to the hospital for further treatment? Not unless it's absolutely necessary. I will send her there for checkups, but she will not reside there. Richard already knew he had made a mistake when he didn't have her leave the hospital earlier. He had already heard of her crazy attempt of forcibly leaving the hospital room. While Richard was lost in his thoughts, his phone rang. He glanced at his phone with disdain. Ryan was calling him. That brute had probably heard of his plan of moving her out of the hospital. He picked up the phone. What is it, boy? Why did you let her leave the hospital? Ryan's voice was lifeless, but Richard heard the destructive anger within the placid man's tone. She's my granddaughter. I don't have to give you any reason for my decision. She needs treatment. The first hospital offers the best that this country has seen. For the last time, she is my granddaughter. I have taken care of her for an enormous part of her life, 
and I will continue to do so. Richard could not believe how gutsy this man was, but he should have expected it. All this young man cared about was his granddaughter and her well-being. Everything else must have been a blur to him. She's stubborn when it comes to her own health. Taking her out of the very place that can provide it to her is a dangerous gamble just because she dislikes the room. It seems you don't know her as well as you originally thought you did. Richard's words were like a slap and rude awakening to Ryan, whose irritable presence could even be felt over the phone. His voice, deep and rough, was demanding. Richard was not surprised to see why Mr. West had decided to pick Ryan as his successor to the underworld. His aura, his behavior, everything about him was perfect, with the right amount of authority. But he was too damn stubborn, just like Zoe. Zoe is fearful of the hospital. It ties back to her past, something she desperately wants to forget. Keeping her there might be good for her physical well-being, but her mental state will deteriorate in that room. He thought back to her escape. You've seen it too, I assume. She has always been stubborn, but when you conversed with her in that hospital room, did you realize how irrational she had become? Ryan scowled. Irrational? She's always been that way. He didn't pick up drastic changes except for her sudden shift in emotions that changed too quickly for it to be normal. One minute she was calm, the next she was at his throat. I will not disclose much of her history, for I already know you will dig into it. The only thing I can tell you is to continue being patient with her. He was worried about their relationship. This man was already displaying very possessive behavior over her. There are some things that she does that are unexplainable. I'm sure you want answers to them, but you must not force it from her. If she doesn't want to open up, don't force her to do so. She will just clamp down harder than before. Richard knew how dense this man was. He could only hope his words would get through to Ryan. I know you've been patient with her for a while. You may feel like you take one step forward, but two steps backward when arguing with her. But that's not the real case. The car had arrived at Ardolf Corporation, so he knew he needed to end the conversation soon. This is a very selfish request from me, but I recommend that you continue your patience. When the time is right, she will open up to you. Richard wondered if his granddaughter would finally place her ego aside and open up to him. If she reaches out to you, see it as a sign that she's changing. Richard hung up the phone and stepped out of the car. Ryan wordlessly listened to the words of this elder. There were times he wanted to comment and argue, but he remained respectful, for this man knew her the best. Just then, his phone dinged, which made him glance down and see it was a message from his mother, but his brows furrowed upon reading it. Don't be mad at Zoe anymore. Just return her calls. Listen to what she has to say. Frankie. He scowled upon seeing she had used his mother's phone just to contact him. How could she be this persistent? It was no wonder Zoe was protective of his younger sister. Their loyalty for each other was commendable. Episode 136, Source of Happiness. When Zoe arrived at the main mansion, she surprised the new servants who weren't used to seeing such a grown woman be afraid of thunder. But old butler Reginald knew what to do. He led her to the bedroom, ordered for warm milk with honey, and had the curtains shut tight. The windows were locked, the lights were turned on, and Reginald took further precautions by playing soothing but loud piano music that blocked out the noise. He then instructed some of the staff to bring a noise-canceling machine and had it set up. When she was done with her warm milk, he fluffed the pillows and was able to coerce her to sleep. Reginald let out a sigh of relief upon seeing her finally, blissfully asleep. By the time Richard got home from work, he was exhausted. The meeting ran longer than planned, and many complications arose, but he was finally home. Seeing the boss was home, Reginald immediately went downstairs to greet him. Welcome home, Mr. Ardolf, Reginald said, taking the heavy coat from him, draped it over his arms. How is Zoe? Richard said, tilting his head towards the stairs. She's fallen asleep. Richard let out a tiny sigh of relief. Good. She was able to sleep the storm away. Dr. Green will be here tomorrow. Have the supplies ready. 
Get one of the maids to change her bandage tomorrow morning. Understood. Reginald regally bowed his head as Richard walked past him and into his office. Ryan pondered about his next move. He wanted to do the chasing this time, but with an injured body, he knew she could not leave the Ardolf mansion to personally visit him. He didn't have the patience to wait for two more weeks for her condition to stabilize either. It was hard for him to get a good night's sleep whenever he was worried about something. He had also already gotten accustomed to sleeping with her in his arms. The only way he felt reassured that she was safe at night was when she slept in his embrace, perfectly tucked next to him. He could easily talk to her over the phone, but he wanted to see her in person. He pressed his lips together and phoned Joshua, who was FaceTiming his wife. Reluctantly, Joshua answered the call. Yes, boss? How long do I have to remain here? Joshua scrunched his eyebrows in confusion. Did his boss want to leave already? But they just got here. At least three days until everything is finalized. When is the meeting? Nine in the morning tomorrow. What else is on the schedule? Well, you have to tour the property, attend the banquet, and... Prepare the private jet. I'm heading back to Boston tonight. I will return tomorrow morning. But boss... Ryan hung up the phone. Joshua frustratedly groaned. It was so difficult to work for this man. He has to worry about the company's well-being, as well as cater to such a demanding person who rarely listens to advice from others. His lips thinned, for he already knew who the boss was returning to Boston for. It was all because of that needy and spoiled woman. He wished she could be of actual use to his boss, instead of just being a source of happiness. Chloe would be the perfect description for this. Not only was she extremely competent, but she was also beautiful, inside and out. She was mature and would not need to constantly stick to the boss's side, unlike Zoe. Bright and early the next morning, Dr. Green came over to do a checkup on Zoe. He made sure her bandage was properly changed and dressed. After prescribing her medicine, he recommended some light exercises for her to do every day, such as taking walks in the garden. Richard had ordered a set of IV bags to be sent from First Hospital, as well as a drip pole for her so she could still receive the same treatment as in the hospital. After making sure everything was comfortably set up for his pampered granddaughter, Richard prepared to leave for work. He turned to his granddaughter, who was lost in her own thoughts, her eyes hazy and spaced out. Zoe, I'm off to work now, he told her, giving her head a gentle and warm pat. Slowly, her head tilted upwards towards him. She quietly nodded, a soft smile on her face. Have a good day at work, she said, bidding him goodbye and watching as he walked out of the room. She spent her entire afternoon in her old room, filled with decorations that had remained the same even after all the years she didn't spend in here. Not a single furniture was out of place. Aside from some minor cleaning, the spacious and overly violet room was still the same. After reading a book, glumly browsing through the television, and taking her medication, the day passed by uneventfully. She wanted to contact Ryan on many occasions, but was too fearful the past would repeat itself. If she kept on calling him when he didn't want her to, she was scared of coming off as clingy. She learned the more she clung on to someone, the more they were inclined to leave, and every fiber within her didn't want him to. Despite their stubborn arguments and petty bickering, a big part of her still yearned for him. It was tough to sleep without his comfort. The nightmare she had had during the rainstorm was an evident example of that. She ate her dinner in her room, with a propped up table on her bed while watching reruns of The Office. Her grandfather was out on a business dinner today and couldn't join her, but she didn't mind. This room was all she needed, for a big part of her life was spent alone. She could bear with it a bit longer. After the maids came in to change her bandages, give her the medication, and change the IV drip bag, she fell into another destructive nightmare. But this time, it was one that would haunt her for the rest of her life. Episode 137, It Hurts, 3 in the Morning. Ryan wordlessly strolled down the dim and winding hallways of the Ardolph Mansion. 
He was impressed by the top-notch security placed around. It was extremely hard for him to break in past the electrified fences, the guard dogs just a few yards away from the main door, and the lasers hidden in the hallways. But nothing was impossible for Ryan. He walked down the hallways, wondering which room she was in. It was a full moon tonight, so there was enough moonlight seeping through the windows to guide him down the corridors. After a few minutes of walking, he finally came across a door with a golden plate that had her name on it. He pushed the door open, locking it behind him. His footsteps were very quiet, so much that it didn't create a single noise. So when he heard a cry, he stiffened. His head snapped to the right, where there was a bed with muslin curtains hanging down from the top. No, I'm sorry. Ryan felt as if his heart was being ripped into pieces. Her soft cries, the sniffles, everything was like a merciless jab to his heart. He rubbed his chest in hopes of soothing the shooting pain. He walked towards the bed and lifted the curtains, his heart breaking on the spot when he saw her. Her eyes were squeezed shut, her dark, silky hair cascading around her. His eyes trailed to her softly parted lips, the enticing color drawing him closer. She was clenching the white blanket so tightly, her delicate fingers were ghostly pale, nearly blending into the blanket. There were droplets of cold sweat on her forehead, causing her fringe to stick to it. Tears were continuously rolling down her cheeks silently, accompanied by soft cries and sobs. Oh, love, he hoarsely whispered upon seeing her state, immediately wiping her tears away. He stiffened when she suddenly cried out, No, don't touch me! She shrieked in her sleep, her words alarming him. Hearing those words, the temperature around them turned into a murderous chill. Ryan's eyes became darker than night, the color resembling an endless abyss. Who was touching her? Who dared to cause her to have nightmares like this? Please, she wept, her voice so broken, it instantly beckoned him towards her like a moth attracted to a flame. He saw she was still asleep, but her grip on the blanket had further tightened. Ryan felt as if his heart was being continuously shredded. Quickly, but gently, he pulled her into his warm embrace, prying the blanket out of her fingers. The minute he succeeded, she roughly grabbed his fingers instead. Stop it, it hurts, she wailed, struggling in his arms, clearly not understanding reality. Her dreams were mocked by the sound of clothes being ripped and a frantically struggling woman. Shh, shh, it's all right. He gently comforted her, pressing her head to his shoulders, gently pulling his finger out of her tiny hand. Quickly, it seized his white shirt. He ignored the fact that she was bunching up the expensive silk worth thousands. If it comforted her to hold something, he'd rather have it be him. It hurts, make it stop, it hurts. She sobbed, each word painfully slicing his heart. He didn't know what nightmare she was experiencing, but he could only hope it would quickly pass. It'll stop soon. Don't think about it. He continued to murmur, reassuring words into her ears, gently cuddling her in his arms, continuously rubbing his calloused hands gently up and down her back as he soothingly patted the back of her head. It's going to be all right soon, he whispered, continuing to console her. Occasionally, he would press kisses upon her forehead, his lips lingering there while he beckoned her with comforting phrases. Soon, she stopped struggling in his arms and instead snuggled into it. He gently wiped her tears away, handling her with care. He leaned his head on top of hers, continuing to soothe her. When he saw that she had calmed down, he held her still for as long as he could. He didn't know why he came here, but his body just brought him here. A tiny part of him knew it was because he couldn't sleep properly without knowing whether or not she was safe. Even if she was in her grandfather's house, he was still worried about her health. After seeing her previous state, he decided it was a good thing to have come here. She mumbled something in her sleep that he couldn't properly understand. He pulled back a bit to listen to what she was saying, but the hand scrunched his silk button up, gripped tighter, and roughly yanked him back to her, continuing to rest her head right below his shoulder. He stared at her in astonishment before a smile slowly spread on his lips. Ryan? 
she mumbled in her sleep. Startled at her words, he looked at her and saw her eyes were still shut, but her eyebrows were now pulled together and her lips were tugged downwards. He anxiously waited to hear what she was about to say to him. I, I... She grumbled some gibberish, and the arm wrapped around his shoulders tightened. Ryan sighed at the anticlimactic ending as she went on to say something else that was completely unintelligible. You, he frowned, not catching the first part of her speech. You're a tease, even in your sleep, he quietly said, adjusting the blankets and then gently placing her back onto the bed. He had a hard time getting her to properly lay down because of the arm that was tightly holding onto his shoulder for dear life. It took every ounce of his patience and self-control not to throw his logic out the window and just climb into bed with her. He knew it was already violating their trust by coming to her room unannounced, and he didn't want to cross the line further. I'm sorry, he whispered to her, apologizing for what he did to her previously and also for forcibly prying her arm away from him. She kicked her blanket in her sleep. He chuckled at her behavior, pressing butterfly kisses on her dainty fingers, desperately wishing it was her lips instead. But he didn't dare to do so, in fear that she would wake up. He gently placed her arms into the blankets before tucking her in. He sat up straight, ready to leave, but paused when he looked at her face. He hesitated to leave. Bending down, he pressed a final kiss on her forehead, his lips lingering there for a few seconds while he reluctantly pulled away. With one last kiss on her nose, he stood up to leave. So he woke up the second he forcibly detached her arm from around him. Without warning, she climbed out of bed, her feet making tiny shuffles on the cold marble ground. And before Ryan could even react or turn around, she wrapped her arms around his waist, taking him by surprise. Don't go, she whispered, holding on to him tightly, burying her face into the back of his perfectly ironed suit. She was terrified he would push her away or leave her as he had done before. Please, she felt her fingers nervously shake. Ryan was awfully quiet for a while. His silence scared her, and she could do nothing else but hug him tighter, pressing her entire body into his back to the point where she could feel the muscles of his back contracting. Can we talk it out? She added on, her voice barely above a whisper. The longer he stayed quiet, the more her fear of him leaving wrapped around her. Unknowingly, her walls were beginning to crumble until her heart was fully exposed to him. If he pushed her away now, her entire world would crumble into nothingness. Episode 138, Pathetic. There's nothing to talk about. His words shattered her. Brian, I... Get off of me, he sharply said. His voice was deep and gruff, the irritation heavy in his voice. So he felt like her heart was stomped to dust. She opened and closed her mouth, unable to form words. Her eyes prickled and burned, her lips wobbled, and she was trying her best to suppress a sniffle. She wanted to win him over with her words, not her tears. No, she replied, her voice cracking. When he grabbed her arm in an attempt to shove it away, she locked it together with great difficulty because of how tiny and short her arms were. Why can't we talk it out? She hoarsely whispered, trying her best to suppress the welting hot tears that pooled in her eyes, threatening to fall at any given second. I've chased you long enough, he muttered, slowly prying her fingers open one by one, his expression hidden away by the shadows. Don't touch me. He sounded angry, but his eyes were dancing with happiness. She was chasing him. She was finally chasing after him. Ryan, at least let's talk about it. A relationship without communication cannot work. Oh, we're in a relationship? I could have sworn we were friends. He responded roughly. We are friends, but we... Then the discussion is over, Ryan scowled. She was back to the foolish talks about being a friend. Do friends share intense makeout sessions, share the bed together comfortably in each other's arms? Do friends talk about marriage? That was barely a discussion. 
She felt a lump rising through her throat, and in her slightest hesitation, Ryan had unraveled her arms around him. His long legs easily carried him to the door faster than she could chase after him. He opened the door, ready to step out, but a thin, pale arm stretched out and slammed it shut. You... I like you, she blurted out, irrationally saying the only thing she could think of. He paused, his heart racing fast. Did he hear her correctly? Did she finally profess her feelings for him? I don't, he lied, testing her reaction. Zoe's face went blank. The dam within her eyes broke loose. Tears rolling out in heavy droplets began to fill an entire ocean. She felt tongue-tied. There was a lump in her throat. She couldn't breathe, nor could she think properly. In her hazy state, she let out a sniffle, then a hiccup, and it didn't take long for her entire face to scrunch up and crumble, her body swaying on the spot. She took swift steps backward, pressing a hand to her aching chest. I... I... The first sob came out, and that was enough for Ryan to realize he had gone too far. He swiftly turned around. The sight he witnessed was like a stab to his chest. This was the first time he had witnessed her cry because of him, and it was not a pleasant feeling. Her eyes glistened. The one that always shimmered like brilliant stars were wet, the tears flowing nonstop. He walked to her, but she took steps back to create distance. He immediately regretted pushing her too far past her boundaries. He only wanted to test her a little, but didn't realize he would hurt her like this. Guilt and remorse wrapped around him like a heavy blanket as he looked at her. Look away from me. She didn't want him to see her cry like this. She refused to win him over with tears, but she couldn't control her emotions anymore. It was the first time she had cried in a really long time the feeling almost foreign to her. She swore she would never cry over a man as she had done with Mike in the past. I'll stop bothering you. I I'll stop showing up in front of you. She babbled, hurriedly wiping her tears away. But the more she wiped, the more they flowed out. She knew she must look like a mess right now. She was too embarrassed to even look at him. Her head dropped in shame. She took a few more steps backward until her shoulders collided with the glass window. It only took a few long strides from him to close the distance. If you don't show up in front of me, I'll kidnap you and force you to bother me. He scowled, harshly grabbing her by the wrist, slamming her frail body to him. His thick arms wrapped around her thin waist, pressing her body to him. I don't like you, stubborn woman. I think I'm in love with you. He breathed out, embracing her tighter. It was the only thing he could do to stop the stabbing pain in his chest. He didn't think tears would ever be his weakness. But seeing her cry like that, he was willing to toss all logic out the window. You only care because I'm being pathetic by crying in front of you and... Crying does not make you pathetic. In the end, we're only human. He gently whispered to her, moving his hand to caress the back of her head soothingly. I don't want to win you over with tears. You already won me over the second you hugged me, he confessed, squeezing her tighter, bending down to press a loving kiss on the crown of her head. All of his anger for her had washed away the minute she climbed out of the bed to hug him. Her simple gesture was enough to disperse the dark cloud looming over him. Hearing her sudden confession was like hearing wedding bells. Then why did you let me go? She naively asked, staring up at him as if he had wronged her. He let out a burst of light laughter at her adorable expression. Her eyes were trembling, her brows slightly tucked together, and her lips slightly jutting out. I wanted you to chase after me. He smiled down at her, using one hand to brush away her fringe and the messy strands of hair framing her face. He used this thumb to wipe the wetness on her cheeks away. It wasn't right, she croaked, sniffling and burying her face back into his chest. She furiously rubbed her face against his silk shirt, not caring if she was ruining the expensive clothing. With how tightly he was holding her, she couldn't move her arms to wipe her tears away and could only do it on his shirt. It wasn't right for you to insult me like that, 
he patiently told her while patting the back of her head, occasionally running his hands through her hair. You caged me inside of the room as if I was a prisoner. I didn't like that. She was worried they would start another fight, but she needed to fix their communication issue. It was not healthy for him to continue this overly protective behavior. Sometimes it was nice, but this time it was too much for her. I was trying to keep you safe. You could have done it differently. I understand I was in the wrong for arguing with you so quickly and letting my temper get the best of me, but I will not apologize for fighting for my freedom. Being too controlling in a relationship, though it might be hard for you to change, is not something I desire. She looked up at him and shivered upon seeing the coldness in his eyes. I'll admit, we both overreacted. However, you cannot justify that domineering behavior of yours by saying you're keeping me safe or that you're doing it because you like me. I've already experienced so many controlling men in my life. I don't want another one, she firmly said, leaving no room for discussion. A relationship is made up of compromises. Not everything can go your way. Episode 139, Not Ready. She brought his face down to her height so that she didn't have to tiptoe so much, but he had a better idea. She yelped when he suddenly lifted her up. He carried her to the couch and sat down, setting her body on his lap. He continued to have his arms tightly wrapped around her waist, despite the burning frustration he felt upon hearing her words. I like you, Ryan. She raised her head to directly look him in the eye. I really, really do. Her words were enough to quell his anger that immediately dispersed into thin air as if it was never there in the first place. But if you want this relationship to work, you have to understand my boundaries. I hate being combined. I hate having my freedom taken away from me just because you worry about my health. I don't want a relationship to be toxic, she whispered, bringing his face down to place her forehead against his. She softly smiled, leaning in to swiftly kiss him on the lips. His eyes darkened the second she pulled back. He tried to lock her lips into a deeper kiss, but she quickly moved her head back. I want proper communication. Don't storm out just because of an argument. Stay behind and let's talk about it. I understand we will feel frustrated, but in the end, I want to have a proper conversation so that we can peacefully resolve it. She paused to make sure he was fully listening to what she was saying. Seeing he was diligently hearing her out, she continued. Having so many misunderstandings in our relationship is not healthy, especially when our relationship has barely begun. She needed him to thoroughly listen to her words. I'll accept your conditions, but I also have rules of my own. He brushed her stray hair aside, bringing it behind her ears. Don't push me away after a small rift. Don't shut me out. Don't keep your unhappy thoughts to yourself. Voice it to me. Tell me how you're feeling. Don't walk away and expect me to clearly understand what's wrong. I can read your body, but not your brain. He caressed the back of her head. I'll be less controlling, as long as you properly communicate with me about what you dislike about my behavior. You tend to not voice your desire and opinions in fear of coming off as clingy. Don't do that anymore. Tell me everything you have to say. I'll take the good, just as I will take the bad. She took his terms into careful consideration before nodding her head. Okay, I'll try, she declared, and that was all he needed to hear before lifting his head to kiss her. The kiss started off slow, soft, and gentle until he angled the back of her neck so that their lips were molded perfectly. Then he went in for a more passionate, deeper kiss, and without warning, his hands moved closer and closer to her, and right when it was about to graze her body, she pushed him away. No, she yelped, and that was all it took for him to take his hand and immediately retract. Her heart raced in fear and panic, her eyes no longer cloudy with desire. It was wide, terrified even, as she stammered out, I I'm not ready. Shh, it's okay, you don't have to explain anything. Ryan sensed something was wrong, but he continued to soothe her anxiety. Relax, my dear, 
he muttered, continuing to whisper comforting words to her. She buried her face into his shoulder, her hand curled around him, clinging on tight. The memories of the past were attempting to rush over her, but his soothing words suppressed it before she had her first panic attack after a long time. Her eyes were beginning to tiredly drop, but she tried her hardest to fight the sleep. Ryan, she whispered, her voice thick with exhaustion. Go to sleep. He rubbed her back, his warm hands traveling up and down in an attempt to coerce her into falling asleep. She slowly closed her eyes. I really, really, she breathed in. Like you, she mumbled, her voice airy and light. And just like that, she fell asleep. Ryan looked at her with an adoring smile on his face. He stared at her long lashes, the way it gently framed her lovely eyes, and at her pouted, rosy lips. Her beautiful dark raven hair cascaded down her back, a few strands covering her pale cheek. I like you more, he whispered, kissing her cheek and carrying her back to bed. He wanted to stay the night, but he knew he couldn't. Not that he cared, but Richard would raise all living hell if he found out that Ryan had snuck into his house and shared a bed with his granddaughter again. He also had to work. The helicopter was parked a few miles away from the Ardolph mansion, and he had to head back. I like you a lot more, he added, tucking her into the bed and adjusting the pillows so that she was comfortable. He leaned down to kiss her lips one last time. Good night, my love, he hummed, brushing her hair away and quietly slipping into the shadows of the night. Episode 140, A Dead End. When Zoe woke up the next day, she was disappointed to see that the other side of her bed was empty. He didn't stay the night, but she understood that he was busy. He had rushed from his work last night just to see her, and that was more than she could have ever asked of him. She tilted her head and was about to climb out of the bed to freshen up when she saw a small bottle sitting on the nightstand. She picked up the note next to it and raised a brow. For the scars, R.W. She unscrewed the top and saw it was an ointment. She examined the minimalistic and small glass bottle. She didn't think much of the scratched out price and set the bottle back down, assuming it was really expensive. Dr. Green came over again to check her status, and when Zoe showed the bottle to him out of curiosity, he was disinterested at first, but kept his face neutral. There are plenty of anti-scarring ointments on the market, he commented, unscrewing the top. When he took a waft of it, his eyes widened. He looked at the bottle again, his lips parting in shock upon seeing the painting. He placed his glasses on, and sure enough, there was a tiny signature painted beside a tree. This? How did you get your hands on this? His voice was filled with astonishment. Wasn't this the ointment rumored to have been passed down from the Imperial family? The formula is a secret, and nobody outside of the Imperial family knows about its contents. He thought the smooth, translucent cerulean brush marks looked familiar, but he didn't think it was the same kind he saw in books. It was a gift. Zoe didn't understand his bewildered expression. It was just an ointment. Why was he overreacting? A gift, young lady. Whoever your friends are, I would advise you to thank them heavily. This is not any average cream. Dr. Green placed the jar back onto the nightstand. When he saw she was still confused, he explained the backstory of it. After his explanation, he took his leave. Zoe was surprised to hear about the value of the bottle before she let out an exasperated sigh. He was winning by a milestone in their gift war. How could she ever get back at him for it? She spent the rest of her day worrying about what to give him, and in the end, she couldn't come up with a good idea. After Ryan finished his meeting, he hurriedly rushed back to Boston, not wasting a single minute. The touring and meeting had taken longer than expected, going late into the night, but he was still persistent on leaving for Boston. When his entire team wanted to stay the night and rest, before going back early in the morning, Ryan was the first to leave. And seeing their boss leave, the people were more inclined to follow him and do the same. 
On the way back, Ryan had questioned Joshua on their progress with Esperanza Investment Firm. But to no avail, the poor secretary couldn't show any successful results. Sir, the company has continued to remain tight-lipped about who their CEO is. When it came to executing orders from his boss, Joshua was more persistent than Frankie. Over the past few days, he had contacted Esperanza nonstop, and on one occasion, he nearly made the poor representative cry, never once relenting. Continue to pester them, Ryan frowned. The longest time a company could withstand the West Force was less than three days. Everyone would eventually crack from the pressure and give in to the West Enterprise's request. Yes, sir. Joshua firmly nodded, already coming up with different plans of contacting the company. If they continued to ignore his advances through the phone, he would personally visit the place. Their headquarters was also coincidentally in Boston, not far from the Ardolf Corporation. It would be a quick and easy trip to get there. The reports in regards to the Silver Crown. So far, most of the men have woken up. We've managed to capture Flynn, who claimed to be the leader of the clan, but there was, in fact, someone else in a higher position. Joshua tried to not wince when he saw the pictures that the men had sent in. The Imperial team, within the short span of three minutes, had completely annihilated those people. Their body was disfigured in many places, their limbs bent to odd angles, and there was a lot of internal bleeding, as most of the team practiced advanced techniques of torture that caused both external and internal injuries. The identity of the person remains unknown. However, our men are working on it, Joshua said, scrolling on his tablet. So far, they have given us information on the appearance of a man who commissioned them. A name was not mentioned or given, for the person did not provide one. But the payment was made in half cash and half credit. Our team tried to track down the latter, but it was a dead end. It was a fake bank account created under a false alias and identity. Ryan slowly raised a brow. A dead end? It must have been someone experienced in this line of work. To create a false alias and identity, one must have access to the government's database or connections to banking corporations. Investigate further. There should be no stones unturned. Ryan muttered, just as the private jet landed in Boston. Yes, boss, Joshua nodded, typing in the orders. He watched him exit the jet and onto the walkway. From the corner of his eyes, he could see Chloe's awestruck expression. Though she was trying her best to hide it, Joshua's skillful eyes caught on to it. Chloe couldn't help but feel her throat run dry when she saw her boss with a plain light shining upon his back. His tall and slender body walked without a care in the world, his long black scarf blowing in the wind. The trench coat highlighted his biceps, and one could tell just from looking at his back, he was a very dangerous man. Her heart skipped a beat when Ryan looked back, his eyes slightly squinting because of the light. Her heart rapidly thumped against her chest when his eyes briefly connected with hers before looking away and settling on Joshua. Drive home. I won't need guards accompanying me home tonight. Ryan walked off into the distance, completely ignoring Chloe's stares. Not that he ever cared for it in the first place. He was already used to the gawking stares from people that marveled at his perfect features. Chloe felt her brows tug together in confusion at his words. He would not need guards for tonight? Did that mean he wasn't going home? If so, where would he go? It certainly wasn't the main mansion, for she knew the overly protective West parents would be disappointed if they saw Ryan walk in without any guards. So where else would he go? She tilted her head curiously. Her brain wandered to something else. Was he visiting a mistress? But it's been so long since his one-night stand tendencies. She wanted to turn around and ask Joshua about it, but didn't dare to. The only thing she could do was bite down on her tongue and try not to overthink everything.